Hey everybody, today I'm going to show you guys how to use ZBrush, and this is for beginners, so if you've never even opened the program, or if you tried it once and it scared you, this is the perfect video for you because we're going to make a character from start to finish, from scratch, in one sitting. ZBrush is an extremely powerful program for sculpting 3D characters, and it's the industry standard, but it has a pretty intimidating interface and workflow. In this video, we're going to start with a ball of clay, and take the character all the way up to the point where it's ready to be textured. This is the same workflow that I used to create our vampire character and our Goatman character. From there, you could jump into our previous video on Substance Painter if you want to completely finish the character. Now, I am going to do a video in the future in Substance Painter on how to paint this character's organic skin, so be sure to subscribe if you want to be ready when that video comes out. Now, you don't need anything to follow along. You can just open up the program and follow along with me, but I am going to upload my project files and link them in the description if you want to check them out. All right, let's jump into ZBrush. All right, so here we are inside of ZBrush, and you're going to notice in this video pretty quickly that the interface is very strange. It's not like any other 3D program that you've probably used. There are some things that most people like about it, and a lot of things that most people don't like about it, but you will get used to it if you use it a lot. So just practice and, you know, you'll get used to it. So when you first open the program, you have what's called the light box. This is kind of like a file browser, and you could toggle that open and closed right here with the light box button. So if you need to get back to it, it's right there. And you'll also notice that depending on the size of your monitor, the canvas might actually be small. It might not fill the whole screen. Uh, the first thing I usually do is go up to document and hit new document, and it will create a new document that's the size of your screen. The interface here is also very customizable. You don't have to leave it this way. Um, this is one of the things I actually really like about ZBrush. You can see over here on the right, we have the tool menu. And this menu is actually the same as this tool menu right here. You can actually see when I open the menu at the top, it disappears from the right. That's because it's the same thing. So all of these menus are dockable on the side. And if you see this little vertical dotted line here, you could double click that and close that sidebar. And if you wanted to, you could open up the one on this side. You could have them both open. And if you find that you use a certain menu all the time, like for example, preferences, you can click this little corner widget and just drag it to where you want it to go. If you don't want this anymore, you just click it and it closes. If you like your tools on the left side, you could drag it over here, close that side. This is the way I usually work. So if you're ever watching other tutorials online, people definitely customize their interface. And if you're ever confused about where they're getting their buttons, just look here at the top and it's these menus here. They're just docking these menus. Okay, so if you actually just start painting on the canvas, you get this really weird brush. It's called the simple brush. It's right here. And it's kind of like paint, but it's also got some depth to it. And this kind of shows what ZBrush was originally intended to do when it was first made. It was like a two and a half D painting program, basically. It was like a painting program where you could bring in 3D models. And that's part of the reason why the interface is so weird is because it wasn't really originally supposed to be a pure 3D program. That's just how people use it now. So if you want to clear the canvas, just hit Control N and let's bring something actually 3D here onto the canvas. If you click over here in the tools, you can see a bunch of basic 3D shapes. Let's grab the cube and what you do to get your 3D object onto the canvas is you click and drag. And you may notice that if you keep clicking and dragging, it's gonna keep adding cubes to the canvas. And again, that goes back to that two and a half D painting application of this program. The idea is you would have a painting and you would bring in a 3D model of like a tree or something and you could just slap it all over your painting. So that's what that's why it's doing that. Again, you can always clear your canvas. Now, if you want to edit the 3D object, you click and draw it on the canvas and then you go over here to edit or the hot key is T. And you click on that. And now if you click and drag on the canvas, you can see we're turning the object. Now by default, the perspective is set to orthographic, so it looks a little bit distorted. If you press P for perspective, now we have a perspective camera. And you could toggle that on or off. Now's a good time to talk about the interface controls. This is very strange. It's designed to work with a pen tablet, so the controls are a little different from any program you may have used, like Maya or Blender. But basically, if you want to turn the object, you just click on empty space here on the canvas and it will turn the camera. If you want to move the object, you hold down Alt while you click and drag an empty space. And if you want to scale or zoom, what you do is you hold down Alt and start dragging and then you let go of Alt and it will zoom. So it's kind of a strange hotkey where you have to let go of a button to make it work. A really quick note about this interface, if you ever zoom in so far that there is no blank canvas, you can look around the edge of your canvas and you'll see this gray box. If you click outside, that's kind of like the safe area. So if you ever zoom in too far and you can't click on empty canvas outside of the gray box counts as empty canvas. And you can also press F for frame and it will zoom out. 
Okay, let's start sculpting this thing a little bit. So with these default shapes that come with ZBrush, you have to convert them to a 3D object. So before I start sculpting, I have to click right here where it says make poly mesh 3D. And now I can start sculpting on the object. So the way you do that is just by clicking and dragging on the object and it will sculpt and sort of push outward. If I want to push inward while I sculpt, you hold down alt and now it's pushing inward. And if I want to smooth, I hold down shift and now it's going to smooth my shape. There's actually kind of a hidden one too. If you want to relax, which is similar to smooth, but slightly different, you hold down shift and start smoothing and then you let go of shift. Now the real power of ZBrush is in how many polygons it can handle. You can have really, really high resolution models depending on the power of your computer. You could have characters that are 30 million polygons if you wanted to inside of ZBrush. You can see right now I don't have that many polygons, but if I go over to the geometry menu, which is inside of the tool menu, I can hit divide right here and it's going to add polygons. This is not a preview or a modifier. It's actually adding real geometry. And now you can see I can sculpt a little bit more detail. I can keep pressing divide and you can see it's adding subdivision levels. Right now I'm at SDiv 4, which is subdivision 4, and I'm getting more detail as I sculpt. Cool thing about ZBrush is you can scrub up and down the subdivision level, so I can go all the way back down to level one if I want to, and I can edit this on a higher level. And then if I need to add more details, I can go back up to four, and I can just do that freely. It's really cool. Okay, let's talk about different brushes. And actually, let's talk about terminology. In ZBrush, you don't call these things here tools. The things that I'm sculpting with is not a tool. The object is what's called a tool. And that's just a little bit of ZBrush weirdness. So your 3D model is called a tool, or a Z tool. And then the what you would normally call tools in other programs are brushes. So if you click here, you can see all the different brushes. There's tons of them. Some of them have really weird uses. Some of them I don't actually even know what they do because they're just really specific. So feel free to just explore and see what they do. There's some really fun ones. But I can go to, for example, flatten right here and I can make flat, sharper edges. So we get kind of a hybrid, hard surface and organic look with this tool. It's pretty cool. My favorite one is Clay Buildup. This is the one I use to sculpt people and monsters and just the musculature. You can make really sharp edges with it if you want, and then you can smooth them out to make them a little softer. So I really like that Clay Buildup brush. A really useful one is Move. And before I click it, let me just show you how to really quickly find brushes. So if you're ever following a tutorial like this one and someone says, grab the pinch brush, sometimes you have to pause the video so you can hunt for it, but let me show you how to find the brushes really quickly. So if you want to find, for example, the pinch brush, you press the first letter of the brush, so P, and then it'll isolate all the brushes that start with that, and then you'll notice another letter next to it. If you press that letter, it will select the pinch brush, or you could just click on it here. But for example, if I want the move brush, I would type M, and then there's a hotkey V right here, and I would type V, and now I've got the move brush. So what does the move brush do? Well, it's not really a sculpting brush. You just click and drag, and you can pull the mesh around like this and just kind of stretch it out into whatever shape you want. We're not going to go through very many of these brushes, but just to show you, there's some really crazy ones like spiral is pretty fun. You can sort of twist the mesh around It gets some really crazy things. OK, I'm not going to use this model. I've messed it up enough. So let me show you a really interesting little quirk about the interface if you want to clear the canvas and work on something else. So I told you to hit control N to clear the canvas, but it doesn't work right now. And that's because we're in edit mode. If I click and turn edit mode off. Now what happens is it's just going to draw more copies of this shape. And if I want to clear my canvas, I'm going to hit control N. I didn't delete my model. It's not gone. It's actually over here in my tool list. And if I want to draw it back on the canvas, I'm just going to select it, draw it back on the canvas and hit edit again. And now I'm back to editing this model. So it's not gone until you close the program unless you save it. Let's actually talk about saving really quick before we really move on to our actual project, because that's very important. So one of the things about the ZBrush interface that throws a lot of people off is saving and opening. So like I said, originally this program was not a pure 3D program. It was kind of a two and a half D painting program. So if you go up to file, save as, what you're doing is you're saving your, your painting, like this whole image, you're saving the canvas and everything on it and all of the tools or 3D objects. But if you just wanna save this model, this tool, so you can open it up later, you want to use the save inside of this tool palette instead. And later on, if you want to open up a tool to keep working on it, a creature you've been working on, you would go to load tool right here and you would open up your Z tool. Okay, let me clear this guy off the canvas. We don't need him anymore. 
All right, I'm going to talk about another thing called subtools because sometimes your characters need to be made up of multiple parts. So let's just drag this little cylinder on the canvas and hit edit. And I'm going to hit make poly mesh 3D. Let's say I want to attach a sphere to be its head. I'm going to go over to my subtool menu now. It's just above geometry here. And you can see subtool right here. We only have one object attached to this character or to this tool. And so we only have one subtool. But as long as you have things loaded in here in your tool palette, you can hit append right here on your subtool. And this is a list of everything that's loaded into the program currently. And I could attach a sphere. And now you can see I've got a separate subtool right here, the sphere. It's kind of inside the cylinder. So let's click on the sphere. So we're editing that now. And I want to move this up. So it's kind of up on top as his head. So now we're going to talk about move, rotate, and scale. You can see right now we're in draw mode. You can think of that like sculpting mode. But if I want to move something, I'm going to hit W or click on this move button. And now we just have a regular move widget like in any other program. And if I want to go back to editing, you can click on draw mode. And now I'm sculpting again. I'm going to show you just a couple more things about brushes. So if you want to change your brush's intensity or its size, that's up here. You can see draw size. It's right here. And the intensity is right here. I can turn it way up. And now I'm sculpting like crazy. And I can turn it way down to be more subtle. Uh, the hotkeys for that, you press S for size. And for intensity, you press U. Now there's also like kind of a universal hotkey in ZBrush, so you don't have to remember all these. You can just press space bar and hold that down. And you've got size, intensity, focal shift. If you're painting, you can change your color. So a lot of people use this instead. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a character from start to finish. We're going to do the entire workflow. So it's going to be pretty simple so it can fit into one video, but we're going to try to create a finished character. So if you don't already have a base mesh to start with, how do you create one in ZBrush? There's actually a really cool kind of weird tool for that. If you click here on your tool palette, you're going to go look for Z sphere right here. And you're going to click and drag a Z sphere onto the canvas. Let's press edit mode right here. Now, Pay close attention before you start to how you're oriented in the scene because ZBrush can be kind of confusing to gain your bearing. Uh, but notice that you have this little compass here at the top so you can see if you're right side up and facing forward. This tool is very strange. If you just start clicking and dragging, it's gonna start just kind of adding more and more Z spheres onto here. So you get this weird like tentacle thing. <laughs> and if you alt click on a sphere, it will erase it. And we're gonna kind of create like a blobby sort of armature to start with. So I'm going to press X for symmetry. And let's say this is the middle of the chest. So I'm going to make sort of a biped creature. So I'm going to click and drag. And the farther you pull it away from the center, the bigger that sphere is going to become. Now I'm going to move this sphere into position. So I'm going to press W. You can see that switch to my move. And I'm going to position this to be the shoulders. Okay, to go back to the draw mode, you could either press draw or press the key Q. Hot key is Q. And I'm going to click and drag like this. And then let's press W for move and I'll pull this down for the elbow. Let's press Q for draw and then switch to move and go back to Q for draw. And I'm gonna draw now the chest area, but notice that if I start drawing, I get two spheres and I actually don't want that. I want just one in the center. So if I bring my cursor together until it snaps and turns green, now I'm drawing one sphere in the center of the body. Now, it's not just about moving, you can also scale. I could press E for scale and you can scale the sphere as well. Let's draw the hips. And if you've done rigging before, you kind of draw this, I, I usually kind of draw this like a skeleton for a rig. I'm not too concerned about proportions yet. I kind of just want all the body parts on the canvas. If you want to preview what the character is going to look like, you can press A and that will show you what the mesh currently looks like. Just be sure to press A to go back to the Z sphere mode before you start editing again. So you just toggle it back and forth to preview the mesh. Okay, let's draw the neck. And then I'll draw a head. And I usually draw just a little shape for the hands, but I don't do the fingers. Some people do, there's nothing wrong with it, but I like to just create the fingers in a different way, which you'll see. All right, I'm not really sure what type of creature I'm making yet, but I'm gonna say the armature is done. So let's press A to view it. Okay, and if this is what you wanna start with to start sculpting, you can finalize it by hitting make poly mesh 3D right here, like before. Now take note in your tool palette, we have the Polymesh 3D Sphere, that's this character. We'll name him something more useful in a second. But the Z Sphere is still here as a separate tool. So if you need to go back and edit the armature, it actually made a copy of it. So now we're moving on with a copy. If you need to go back, you can go back. But anything we do on from this point is not gonna affect the original character design. So now we're no longer able to go back to the armature. Okay, so 
While I think about what I want to do with this guy, I'm just going to go around usually and start smoothing out these facets. Alright, the next thing I usually do when I'm designing a character is switch to my move brush and I just start changing his silhouette. One brush that is really helpful if you want to add or remove volume is the inflate brush. And what this brush does, basically what it sounds like, it pushes out in all directions. If you hold down alt, it'll shrink, but be careful because it will turn inside out really easily if you're not paying attention. So make sure you don't do that. And we'll switch back to move now. And notice that I'm not even really sculpting yet. I'm just pushing and pulling with the move brush to change the silhouette of the character. I think I'm going to make an alien. I think I've decided. So let's give it sort of a strange shaped head, maybe something wide like that, like a hammerhead. That's the great thing about ZBrush is you can really go crazy and just make whatever's in your imagination. You don't have to think about edges and vertices and faces like you normally would when you're modeling. You can kind of worry about that stuff later and just worry about the form. Let's talk about a really cool feature with ZBrush called DynaMesh. So right now, if I were to make this really extreme, you can see the mesh starts to stretch and sort of break. And if you view the wireframe by hitting Shift F for frame, you can see what's happening is we're stretching the polygons out. But let's say I really do need some really long stretched out shape here. We can turn on something called DynaMesh. That's over here under Geometry, DynaMesh. Now be careful with this because it will destroy your edge flow. So if you're bringing in a model from another program and you meticulously uh, extruded and inserted edge loops exactly where you want them, this will undo that. It will also undo UVs. So if you've already modeled something in another program, you don't want to turn on DynaMesh. This is just for if you're starting with a ball of clay in ZBrush. But I'm going to hit DynaMesh and we can see the mesh changed a little bit. If we lose too much resolution, we can hit undo and then increase the resolution here before we turn on DynaMesh. But I actually think I don't need this much resolution, so I'm going to undo and I'm actually going to turn it down a little bit. So I'm working with a lower resolution. I like to work with really low resolution at first, so it's very easy to smooth and form the silhouette. Not worried about details at the moment. Now, here's the real power of DynaMesh. If we go back up to the eye stalks here and I start stretching them out, <laughs> we can see that again, it's really stretching out the geometry. But let's say I just want to evenly divide it. I want to redivide it so there's enough geometry here to maintain this shape. What you're going to do is hold down control and drag a box like this on the empty canvas, and that will update your DynaMesh. So that's kind of another example of the really weird ZBrush interface. It's kind of a strange hotkey. But once you're used to working with this program, it becomes really fast. It becomes kind of second nature to be just kind of sculpting and then going, oh, I need more geometry, just drag really quick like that. So now is actually probably a good time to talk about masking because as I did that hotkey, you may have noticed the word mask right here inside of the box. And that's because the control key is actually the masking key. So if I were to control drag on the model, you can see I'm actually painting. And what that does for us is it makes it so I can't sculpt inside of that dark area. So if I use my move brush, you can see it's not affecting what's inside of the mask. I can control click to invert the mask here in empty space. You just control click once and now it's inverted. And then to clear the mask, you control drag, just like you were updating your DynaMesh. So if you control drag and you have a mask, it will clear it out. And then if I control drag again, it will update my DynaMesh. So once again, it's one of those weird interface things about ZBrush, but it becomes second nature, like, like muscle memory, once you use the program enough. Another cool thing about masks really quick is if you draw one on and then you control click inside of the mask, it will blur it. Now this isn't really gonna be an anatomy lesson, but if you're going to get into character design in ZBrush, I highly recommend you study anatomy. Study human anatomy, animal anatomy, all kinds of anatomy, <laughs> and practice it a lot. In the future, I can make an anatomy video for you guys if you want, leave a comment if you want that. But anatomy is also one of those things where you can watch a video on it, but you won't learn it unless you just practice it. Now, one thing that helps with anatomy or any sort of character design is reference, and I don't have any open right now, so this is going to be a really ugly character. Again, we are just talking about the basics of the program and how the tools work. We can talk about anatomy and good design in a different video. As I'm working, notice that I'm keeping the model as low detail as possible until I need to add detail. I'm not pressing divide to add more polygons when I don't even have fingers yet. So try to do the entire character to the same level of detail before you move on, just like sketching on paper. I'm still mostly using the move brush. Sometimes I'm using clay buildup to add a little bit of anatomy, but I'm not really trying to develop the anatomy and make it look right. I'm just trying to show myself where the rib cage is 
So the only anatomy I'm doing in the early phases is just when I need to basically answer a question for myself. Where's his knee? You know, I'll sculpt the knee on really quick just so I know where it is. And then I go back to the move brush and I'm just changing proportions, changing the silhouette. And I'm just going to fix the pose. I no longer have access to the Z spheres, that mannequin. But you can still use the masking to sort of change the position of your characters if you need to. Okay, I'm going to go back to work on the face a little bit. I think I'm going to keep my character's features really simple for this video. Try to keep the video nice and short. I feel like this character's face is ending up a little bit too human. I know it's weird to say, but <laughs> the layout is just too human. So I'm going to just drastically change it. Maybe his eyes will go way out here. Now he's kind of like a praying mantis. Okay, let's uh just make this head a little bit smaller. Kind of got out of control there. This whole body is still feeling way too human, so I'm just making some crazy changes here. I don't know if you've noticed, but I still have not added any more resolution to my Dynamesh. I'm still at 72, so a very low polygon count. Another really useful brush is called the Damien Standard Brush, and this is just a really sharp sort of cutting brush. So with this brush, I can either do a nice sharp ridge, or if I cut inward, I can do a really sharp cut. And I use this a lot to really define the edge of my anatomy early on. So if I sort of need to cut underneath the pec muscle to define it, I like to use the Damien Standard Brush for that. And you can see when I don't really know what I'm doing, don't really have a plan, I kind of just fall back on human anatomy, and then I just sort of tweak it. <laughs> when I'm just fooling around, I usually end up just making humans with weird heads and weird rib cages. <laughs> now, for the sake of the video and the sake of time, I'm going to have to leave a lot of him underdeveloped. Probably not going to sculpt toes or get too crazy on all the little nooks and crannies. Just enough to show you guys how all the different tools work. So he's looking a little underdeveloped in his feet and in his arms, but let's add a little bit more Dynamesh resolution and do a little bit more detail now. So I'm gonna go to my Dynamesh resolution. I'll turn that up maybe to, I don't know, 128. Let's try that. And if I update my Dynamesh by control dragging on the canvas, you can see I've got more polygons now and I can do more detail. And once you're in this phase where you're sculpting and you're kind of doing primary forms and then subdividing and doing smaller secondary forms, that phase of the project usually takes me maybe a week, maybe two weeks, depending on the character, it can take a long time. So we're really, really rushing through this. This is something you want to take a lot of time on to get it right. Okay, and at this point, I think I'm going to add in some eyeballs for him. So I'm going to go up to append in the subtool palette and I'm going to add in a sphere. I'll switch to that sphere subtool, and I'll press W for move, and I'll just position this into place where I want the eyeball to go. There we go, and now I want to duplicate this to the other side. So in my subtool palette, I can hit duplicate. Now I've got two of them. And if I scroll way down to deformation, I can click mirror, and that's going to jump over. Okay, so now I'm just going to go back to the main body, and I'm going to sculpt the eyelids around it, however it looks good. All right, this is probably good enough for this demo. And if you're doing 3D printing or just sort of sculpting for practice, this is also good enough for that. But if we're going to bring this character into production, it needs to be more organized in terms of the, the mesh. So if we look at the wireframe, we could see it's just a bunch of squares in a grid. It's way too many polygons to animate. So we need to do something called retopology. Now, ZBrush actually has a built-in retopology system. It's kind of like automatic retopology. It's sometimes good enough for the bodies of characters. I personally never use it on characters' faces because it's really important that the edge loops follow a very specific pattern on faces. But it's great for things like 3D scans of environmental pieces. Like if I go out and scan rocks or something, I always use the auto retopology feature in ZBrush because it's really good for that. Face topology is a really deep subject. It could be a video all on its own. So I'm going to just use the automatic features for this character's face. But just know that it's probably not really good enough to do auto retopology on the face if you're making this character for a real production. First thing I'm going to do is duplicate my character's body so that I have the original and I don't mess it up. So I'm going to click on duplicate and now you can see I've got two of them. I'm going to click on the first one and I'm going to rename this alien Dynamesh and I'll hide it. And then I'll click on the second one and let's call this alien retopo. Okay, and then I'll turn on wireframe. Let's go down to geometry and I'm going to open up the sub palette that says Z remesher. Now this will just automatically remesh the model. And if you want to see what it does with default settings, just press Z remesh and wait a couple minutes. And here's the result. It's actually not too bad in some areas. Maybe we need a few more edge loops around the mouth, around the nose and the eyes, but the body actually isn't too bad. I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to press undo control Z. 
And first of all, if you just need more geometry, you can increase the target polygon count right here. Now these are thousands. So if you set your target polygon count to five, it's gonna try to hit 5,000 polygons. If I set it to eight, it's gonna try to hit 8,000 polygons. It's probably not gonna get that low, but that's the target. Okay, and one last time, let's press Z remesher. And this should be the one that we keep. Okay, looking pretty good. And the next step now is to UV map this character. ZBrush does have a built-in default sort of automatic UV mapping tool. Like I said, with the retopology, it's not that great for characters, but let me just show you how it works in case you ever need to use it. It's good enough for environmental scans, like if you go out and 3D scan rocks or trees, but here's how it works. If you go to Z plugin, UV master, I'm just gonna hit unwrap and it's done. If you wanna see what it did, you can go down to the UV map sub palette here and press morph UV. And you can see this is the UV map that it created. It actually created a seam right down the center of the face, which is not good. <laughs> That's why I don't usually use the automatic tool. If you don't have any other way of UV mapping though, um, then this is this will be good enough. If you do want to UV map though in another program like Blender or Maya, we have a video on how to do that. But let me show you the import and export process to get this character out of ZBrush into another program and then back into ZBrush with the edited UVs. To export this character's body to another program, we're gonna hide all the other Z tools. We're gonna go up to Z plugin, sub tool master, export. I'll navigate to my folder and I'll export it as an OBJ. Here's the character in Maya. You could do the same thing in Blender, but I'm just more comfortable with Maya, so that's what I'm gonna use. This is not a UV mapping lesson, so I'm just gonna go really quickly through this part. But we do have a kind of an overview of UV mapping already on the channel, and if you want us to go more in depth to UV mapping, let us know in the comments and we can make a video on that. Another quick note is the character you might notice is really small, and it's also not standing on the grid. It's very important that you don't move, rotate, or scale the character until you're done with ZBrush. Just leave it where it is. Even if it comes in upside down or something crazy like that, uh, we need it to be in the exact same position when we go back into ZBrush, so don't change that. Okay, and that should be good enough for the demo. The purpose of UV mapping is just to lay it flat so that we can texture it. Now that we've done a little bit better UVs, let's bring this guy back into ZBrush. So I'm gonna export him as an OBJ from Maya or whatever program you're using. So we're gonna go back into ZBrush and we're gonna replace this model with the one that has better UVs. There's actually a really easy way to do this. I'm gonna make sure that the model I'm updating is the one that's active and selected here on the canvas. And I'm just gonna go import and grab alien UVs and just import it while the other one is active and it will just replace it. So it looks like actually almost nothing happened and that's a good thing. That's because we didn't change the mesh. We didn't get any warnings. If you import something while another thing is active, it's just going to replace the original thing. So the model's in the exact same place. It just has updated UVs. We can actually check that here in ZBrush to make sure that it worked. If I go down to the UV map and I click morph UV, I can see this is the UV map that I created in Maya. Let's go morph and put it back. So what we actually have now is two models. We have the low poly base mesh that has good edge flow and good UVs. And then we have the high res sculpt, which doesn't have any UVs at all. And it's got a lot of detail, but it doesn't have good edge flow for animation. So what we want to do is project the details from the high res sculpt onto the low res uh, organized mesh. So the way we do that is we turn them both on so they're both visible. And if you roll over the DynaMesh model, you can see the poly count. I can see I have almost 1 million polygons on this character. And if I roll over the UV mapped one, you can see I have 17,000 polygons. You can also see that right here. So what we wanna do is scroll down to geometry and press divide until the low poly mesh has at least 1 million polygons. And there we go, we're at about a million. They both have the same number of polygons, but one of them has more detail sculpted into it. So what we need to do now is actually project the detail from the good sculpt onto the model that has the good mesh. So once again, you want them both to be activated, but all the other sub tools are turned off. So the eyes are not active. And I'm gonna click on the one that's gonna receive the detail, which is alien UV. Now I'll scroll down in the sub tool palette near the bottom where it says project, and I'll press project all. Okay, it looks like it's done. So if I hide my DynaMesh sculpt, I can see that my organized mesh, the one that's called Alien UVs, now has all the detail that I sculpted before. But if I press Shift F to see the wireframe, I can see it has nice organized mesh. So we've got the best of both worlds here. 
At this point, you can actually throw away your Dynamesh or maybe you just kind of move it down to the bottom and save it in case you need it. Now, this is the fun part. Now that we've got good geometry, we can really dig in and do some really fine details. For the sake of time, I can't go too crazy with this thing, but let me just show you a few ideas to get you started. One thing I like to do at this stage is go down to geometry and press divide at least one more time. If it still looks a little bit faceted, this is the point where you actually can press divide again and just really crank up the detail and go crazy with wrinkles and folds and whatever you need to do. So my first step when I'm doing fine detail is to take the Damien standard brush and just manually cut in folds and wrinkles, the big ones, like big creases. Um, like if you're doing a character's face, you can do the, the wrinkles on the edge of the eyelid. You could do smile lines in the corner of the mouth, try to capture all those cool skin folds, the fat folds. Now, if you discover some issues with the anatomy, you can still make changes. The only thing you can't do at this stage is really stretch out the mesh and change it like crazy. So don't be afraid to change the pose or fix anatomy issues, but just don't stretch out new arms where there were no arms before or extra fingers and things like that. Now, this stage of doing fine detail would probably take me a few days, so this is not going to look finished and fully developed. Just trying to show you guys the ideas. Okay, once you've done that, now we can start spraying on detail, which is actually pretty fun. I'm going to switch over to my standard brush, and now we can actually modify this brush to spray detail on. So where it says stroke, I'm going to switch that to spray. And then where it says alpha, we can actually pick some custom alphas in here. I'm going to grab number 60. And this is a good one because you can do directional wrinkles and tension in the skin. So you can see the brush is parallel wrinkles. And if I want to do tension, I can just kind of sculpt in the direction I want the wrinkles to go. And on areas like this, if I don't want tension, I can just kind of go in a circle and I get sort of rhino skin. So it's a really versatile brush. It's very simple, but versatile. I wouldn't usually rely on just one brush to detail an entire character, but I'm going to try to go really fast for the video. He's going to have very uniform skin like an amphibian maybe maybe he's like a frog and if you need to you can always switch back to your damien standard brush and do really characteristic creases where you think they're needed and one thing i'm hoping is coming across in this video is that the fine detail is not masking at all the areas that are underdeveloped so don't rely on fine detail like i am you can see that like it doesn't seem like it has very many features it doesn't look very well developed and just by spraying on detail it doesn't make it look better so the fine detail is actually one of the least important parts of your sculpt in terms of selling it and making it look realistic and lifelike. Getting a nice base form, designing the character from the ground up, and then doing the secondary detail, which is like the anatomy and the way things are connected. That's the most important thing in, uh, to sell your character. And that's the part that I sort of neglected for the sake of time in this video. And it's definitely showing. So hopefully it's a lesson to you guys. Like this hand is not gonna look better just because I'm gonna add <laughs> You know knuckle skin to it so the final step for zbrush is to bake a normal map we're going to get all of that detail from the high res mesh and put it on top of the low res animation mesh as a texture now just like with uv mapping and retopology zbrush has an automatic way of baking and it's not the best one but it's really fast and convenient so i'm going to use it for this video but I would say the right way to bake, or maybe a better way to bake in most cases, is to bake in like Substance Painter or something like that. I'm definitely going to make a video on how to bake in Substance Painter because you guys asked for it in previous comments. So subscribe to the channel so that you know right when that video comes out. But like I said, for this video, I'm just going to do it using ZBrush's automatic method, which is usually not quite as good. So to bake a normal map, I'm going to go all the way down to the lowest subdivision level. And I'm going to go up to Z plugin. I'm going to use multi map exporter and make sure that out of this list, only normal map is checked. Then I'm going to set the resolution that I want. In this case, I'll do 4K and make sure that flip V is activated, flip vertical. And then if we go right here at the bottom to the export options and open up the normal map options, we're going to export a tangent space normal map. We want to smooth normals. And you can flip the green channel or not. It really depends. There's no right answer. It just depends on which program you're going to be rendering in. I'm just going to leave mine on because if it's wrong, it's really easy to fix it in Photoshop. Okay, let's create all maps. And I'll just navigate to where I want it to go. And it's creating the map really quickly. Okay, and it's done. It took about 30 seconds. Now, if you also need a displacement map for your project, you can do that in the same window. So if you go to Z plugin, I'm going to turn off the normal map and switch to displacement. 
And then in the export options, I'm going to look at the displacement settings. And again, every program is different, but here's the way I set it up for Maya. And you can set this up any way you need to. I'm going to set my midpoint to zero or black. I'm going to crank up my DP subpix, which is the quality. And I'm going to do a 32-bit EXR, just so we get the highest quality displacement map possible. Okay, let's press create all maps. And this map will take a little bit longer. Okay, and here's what he looks like when he's done in Maya. You can see it's the low poly animation ready mesh. But when I turn on textures, he's got all the detail. And when I render, he's got displacement and normal map. So he looks the way I sculpted him in ZBrush. At this point, he's ready to go into Substance Painter and have his textures and materials created. We actually just released a couple of videos on Substance Painter. One of them is a complete intro for total beginners who have never opened the program. And the other one is some more advanced tips. Now, if you want to learn anything else about ZBrush or any other program, be sure to leave a comment. I'm already thinking of doing an anatomy sculpting video specifically. And be sure to subscribe so you know right when that video comes out. I think I'm actually going to finish this guy properly and put him up on Render Crate. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. All right, later creators.